So a client comes in, a potential client calls you and says, I'm the one who won $64 million in the lottery. You about me. Uh, sorry, but no, I didn't. Well, the lottery commission did not want to give him his money, but his friend was able to discover on his damaged lottery ticket the winning numbers. And you can see the winning numbers down below here. Well, he contacted me because he said, well, my friend is an architect and I need a forensic document examiner to look at the ticket and, make, and confirm that this is really my winning ticket. My friend showed it to me, but he's an architect. He's not a document examiner. He had hired an attorney, so he's working with an attorney. And what I did is he said that he had put his ticket on his dresser and the sun had bleached it and that's why it was damaged. So I got, went to the went to the store, bought some lottery tickets. I wanted to see if I could damage the ticket and then still see the numbers. So on the top of the lottery ticket, I wrote the numbers that were winning numbers for this particular ticket. And no, it, it was not a winning ticket. I can I assure you of that. So I, I didn't win a billion dollars and throw it away. So anyway, what I did is I went and damaged a ticket, held it over a fire, and was able to char it so that I could not read the numbers. I scanned the ticket on a high, high resolution scanner at, eight, at 800 pixels per inch, and then read it into Photoshop. And in Photoshop, by using some of the the edit or the uh, the man, manipulation techniques or some of some of the techniques for actually being able to change so the way the the ticket looked, I was able to look and and actually see the numbers. They're very faint, but I could see the numbers. And looking at it in color, I could even see it better by using the exposure technique. So using Photoshop, I had developed a technique by which I could look and see lottery ticket numbers on a damaged ticket. So we flew up to the state capital, it's called Sacramento here in California. And I looked at the real lottery ticket because the lottery commission had taken possession of the ticket. And I had to go see if I'm going to be able to authenticate see the real ticket so we go and i go up there and this is these are scans of the front and the back of the real ticket up at the lottery commission and i have shop techniques that i had learned how to use but unfortunately they didn't really work all that well and one of the first things i said to him was this ticket had gotten wet well, it turns out he didn't tell me the whole story it that the way it got damaged also it was sitting on his dresser and he spilled cologne on it. Well, I was able to read through some of the numbers, even though it was so badly damaged. And you what I did is I put on here the the settings the exposure settings that I did in Photoshop because when we do the work and we're doing these experiments we have to make sure that it's both repeatable and reproducible in other words can someone else reproduce what I did and can I repeat it and the only way to do that is to actually document what you did document your procedure so that when you come back and you want to do it again you know how you know what you did so when we're looking at altered documents or potentially altered documents we have to go through because there's no specific way we a lot of times it's pure experimentation to figure out what do we how do we how can we get the answer we need well by going through i was able to see one of the numbers in the winning numbers on this ticket was a 39. in the numbers on the ticket he claims he had there was no number 39 in the winning numbers. So by that, it proved that what he had was not a winning number. And up here, uh, uh, what I've done is I've enlarged the number 39 
and we can actually see the 39 in there. So I had to give him the bad news. He did not have a winning ticket. This is a case that went to, it went to trial out here in California. The question was, there were two identical documents. It's called a trust. And there were two identical except for page number three. Page number three was different. Well, how can you figure out why is the text on one document different from the text on the other? On only one page and only one paragraph and only one line within that paragraph was different. Well, what I did is I scanned the pages at very high resolution. I also looked at them with a digital microscope and did other uh, other tests. But here, what really told, gave the story is on the 15 pages, we can see how the text is laid down or how the toner is laid down. And when we look at that enlarged on page number three, which is the page that was in question, where the question was, how did the text change on page number three from one document to another, and they're both signed. Well, take a look here. On page number three, you can see the deficiencies in the way the toner is laid down there, little white marks, little white, white exposures in the letters. Well, that was unique to page number three. If we look at the other, this is an example of page number seven. Page number seven, the toner is laid down just fine. But on the other 14 pages of this document, the toner is laid down just fine. So page number three had that one difference. So my opinion was page number three must have been printed either on a different printer or on the same printer after it had developed a defect. So page number three was, was potentially inserted into this document. And that's why it was different. Now, the other document examiner was saying, well, there, one of the reasons why the, this particular document with the different page three is different is because if we look at the, the hole punches page to page, they're different. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I did an experiment. I took 15 pages, put them in a three hole punch and punched it. Then I looked at the hole punches under the microscope and I realized that the hole on page number one, which is punched only with a piece of metal, was different than the hole on page number two, which is punched with a piece of metal and a piece of paper. And it's different on page number three, which is punched with a piece of with a metal and two pieces of paper. And that's what I what I learned is that page to page, going drilling down the holes are different. So that was that that defeated that argument. Now, this was an interesting case. Here in the here in the United States, we have these documents that are called trusts, and you can create an, an amendment to a trust. In this particular case, there were eight amendments to a trust that no one contested. Everyone said they're all legitimate but this Ninth Amendment shows up. And that is the document that is being contested. Well, what you're looking at here is, an ex is part of the page with the signature and the address and the witnesses on it on document number, on, on amendment number nine. Well, what I did is I was able to look at, I had the originals of, of the prior amendments. And what I did is I scanned them all in and I looked comparative. And if we look at question n number one, the witness address on top that's in red, you'll see that if we overlay that on top of the witness address from amendment number seven, they're perfectly matched, except what the person did is they left off the numbers. That's what we call a zip code here in the United States. 
They left off the numbers 115 from the authentic document when they lifted it using, I don't know if they used Photoshop or PhotoPaint or GIMP or some other digital editing software, but they lifted it. And so it's a legitimate writing. We look at the witness. And if we look at the, the witness name on the top up here in question number in the questions document, and we look at the Eighth Amendment, the Seventh Amendment, and the si Sixth and the Eighth Amendment. Well, notice what happens if we overlay the question in red onto the Eighth in blue. So what they did is they took off some of the writings. They took off the top part of the F. They took off the bottom parts under the line, under the signature line, so that it wouldn't look exact. But when you overlay them, they're perfect. And the same thing on here with the, with the with, with the decedent's name. It's a perfect match, but from the third amendment. So what this person did is they took a little piece of one amendment, a little piece of another, and they merged them together to create amendment number nine. But they figured that since amendment number nine wouldn't match exactly to any other one, no one would figure it out. Altered document. Now, this was an interesting case. It was from up in Northern California. And the question was, we had a Word document, we had, we had a PDF, and the signatures, well, you can tell it's the same person, but if you, we overlay them, you can see that the, word, the signature from the Word document is smaller than the signature from the PDF. But what I did is I shrunk it down vertically it meaning the PDF signature, I shrunk down. And when you see down here on the bottom, it's perfect match. So what the person did is they lifted the signature and stretched it so it would not be a perfect match when you look at them overlaid one to one. But when I did this on again, we took take the PDF, we take the Word document and we overlay them. It's a it, and then just to make sure you can see that there are traces from the red from the blue signature in the blue writing that they didn't quite take out so there are still some traces like here on the g you can see that there's a little bit of the printed g left over that they didn't get you can see that over here on the writing, there's a, they left little traces, and we can see some of these little marks overlay perfectly. So in other words, they lifted the signature and from the blue document and put it onto the PDF and, and figured no one would figure it out. And on this one, this one was interesting because as soon as I saw this, I knew it was a cut and paste, even though I didn't see the original signature. And the reason is, look at the way this <clears throat> line is cut off, the, the stroke. They came, they cut too close to the, to the stroke. Eventually, we, we found the, uh, the source signature. But just looking at that, my first impression was cut and paste because it's cut, no, no pen does that. Another altered document. This was an interesting case. It was up in Los Angeles County here in California. And the question was, th this is part of a, a divorce. The wife is suing the husband because he, to tran and, and it transferred, or the husband sued the wife because she filed this document that transferred his 40% interest in the property to her. And I blocked out the names so you can't see them. And my, my scanner would do eight and a half by 11 pages. So that it's a longer document. So I had to do two scans to get the top and the bottom. And then I scanned the back as well. Well, what was interesting is there was another deed to another piece of property that was owned by the two. And I scanned that as well. And when I overlaid them, now photocopying 
changes, uh, alters the, 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 the uh, size a little bit. Now, you don't expect that one's going to fit perfectly on top of the other, but what I did is I aligned the date, and you can see how well everything lines up. But let's look in more detail. There were trash marks on the document, and, there, and I, I, I misaligned this a little bit so you can see, because otherwise either the black would cover the red or the red would cover the black. And you'll see over here, dot colon 12 slash 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 and then it says recorded in and so on those are, are a perfect match the same offset as the trash marks it tells me that one is a copy of the other and then when i overlaid the lot colon 12 slash 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 over or I, I didn't overlay it. I, what I did is I scanned this and looked at it at very high resolution. You can see the ghost of the letter S down here. You can see the one they didn't have to do anything to. You can see the ghost of the word and, and you can see the ghost of the one and the nine. So what they did is they took a sharp instrument, scraped off the toner, they made a photocopy, scraped off the toner, then they went and typed in the other numbers than two and a slash 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 and the reason why they're on the two it's missing certain areas of toner is they disturb the fibers of the document and we can see the same type thing here but on the seven they typed in a seven and we can see the old seven under there so my opinion was that one deed was created from the other now this was an interesting case out of Detroit, Michigan, and it was a question, the, the, the attorney's client said, I didn't sign that document, it's my signature. They must have lifted it. Well, when, when they sent the original to me, and I put it on the video spectral comparator, and you could see that page one and page two were from different reams of paper, they, they, under, under ultraviolet. Now, I figure, well, they can claim that it's, they had to change the reams, so what I did is I looked at the overlap area, and then I looked at how was the toner laid down on page one and page two, and we can see clearly that the toner is laid down differently on page one and page two when we look at it with a microscope. So what that told me is the page two was the signature page, page one was the terms of the contract. They lifted a, a signature page from another contract, put it together with a con uh, page one that they made up, and that's how they how this was done. And this was a case where it was a real estate contract. And the question was, all, all different areas that were scribbled out with black ink. And we had to see what was under the black ink. Well, what I did is I used a, a blue light, and then took the took the image. And and with fil with filters as well, and then brought it into Photoshop and using the exposure tool, you could see under there, it said the word tenant that you couldn't read otherwise. And then also using Photoshop and using a technique that's been well documented using lab color, LAB color, I was able to see that it also had written in a different pen, it said AKA. -A under there now this was a this was a case of uh what's called a holographic will or a will that's all in handwriting and the question was did the decedent write the will well what i was able to show i used a nikon camera that's retrofitted to take infrared pictures and you can see that there were underlines, but you can see the underline is in at least two different pens. And then on here, when you read it, the words after I die are right there. But when you look at it using a Retin 88A filter for infrared, those words disappear. So that was added in with a different pen. So again, finding an, a potential alteration on a document. 
And then this is just for, for uh, demonstrative reasons. The question is which line comes first, what, what's over what? There's some software called NEGA from a company in Spain. And it, NEGA stands for Digital Negotoscope. And a, a negotoscope is used by x-ray technicians to, to look at x-rays. But for document examiners, we use it to see which line go, is over which. It gives you a three-dimensional view of the lines. And when, when I look at it in NEGA, you can see that the, the ink goes over the toner. You can see that the, the line coming up goes over the, the other line coming down. That's only for demonstrative purposes, but I use that as well. So then we get into electronic documents. Documents created in Microsoft Word or, micro, or, or uh, PDFs. And we don't have time to get into here because we're almost out of time. But I wanted to show you that if you go into Acrobat DC, it'll show you what application was used. And you can Google that and find out what it, where that's used. You can see it's Corel, so therefore it's probably a WordPerfect document, not Microsoft Word, because Corel makes WordPerfect, and they also make Print Server 160. And then on here on the PDF, using what's called preflight, we can look and we can see that this signature down here is actually broken apart as as two images. And I wish I had time to go through and show all show all that detail but uh but anyway that's one way and, and on this document i was able to show that it was not what it was supposed to be and it settled and my attorney's client got a very nice settlement and this was a case where an, an attorney's client said you ripped up an agreement put it in the trash can i pulled it out and i'm going to sue you well, what I was able to show here is that when we line these up, I, what I did is I lined up this section right here where it says, I hereby and obligation arising. And I wanted to see how well did the rest of the pages align? Did, was it really just ripped up and thrown in the garbage can? Well, you can see in the date, it should have a month there it's the 25th of some month 1999 and you can see that the rest of the, the lines don't line up so therefore he, he we had to understand why why that would have been a ripped up document if the, if the page if this right and left side don't line up correctly and then when we look at uh emails here I'm showing Outlook 2013, here Outlook 365 2000. You can look at the message header, and the message header will tell you where the email started, where how to, and the whole path that went through the internet to get to you. So those are some interesting aspects. Now, when you want to get into the real metadata of an email, that's where you'll I'll, I will refer that out to a computer forensics person because they have tools that can get into real metadata and find out more than I can just looking at this, this kind of metadata. And then in a word, at a Word document, the question is, is it what it's supposed to be? And let's take a look. So if you look at, the, at uh, in Microsoft Word, It'll tell you how, how much editing time was done. What is the, uh, this is the template that was used. But what's interesting here is it says that at total editing time, 38 minutes for 20 pages and 5,098 words. Well, those don't comport. And the reason I wanna show you this is that you can get misleading information from the metadata in Microsoft Word. And we look, let's look down here. It was last modified on March 19, 2021. It was created on March 19, 2021, last printed in December of 2014. Well, those don't make sense either because the template was made back then, but this is when I created the document. So 